Welcome to the On The Edge Podcast with your host, Scott Groves. Hey, what's up all? It's Scott Groves with the On The Edge Podcast. Uh, we're filming tonight with my buddy Rob Caldwell. Many of you have probably heard, if you've watched or listened to this show, uh, a group called Go Abundance that I'm part of. Rob is one of the men that's in that group, which is their mantra is live life big. A lot of property investors, uh, a lot of people trying to become 100 percenters, which we'll talk about that with Rob because it seems like that's a goal that he just hit. Uh, Rob owns a company called Rentwell, started out of Philadelphia, really all about property management. But what's interesting is now, you know, a decade later, uh, he has this fully integrated business where he owns the landscapers. They now invest in properties. They manage, you know, a quarter of a billion dollars of single family residents, small units, small apartment buildings, and now have opened up an investment wing of their own so that they can share in some of the real estate profits. And they've got $10 million of property under management. So just a really dynamic guy that's doing a lot of the right things financially and also has a pretty crazy life story, so we're going to get into some of that. Um, what what did I miss in the thirty second Reader Digest introduction of you, Rob? Yeah, well, if any of my landscaper guys are going to listen to this, which I hope they do, we said that well, uh, I don't own them, but they're they're uh, they they're they're free, they're free and clear. They, uh, yeah, uh, father, four little kids. Um, I'm just an ordinary guy trying to figure this stuff out, too, man. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Humble. So I, I, I happen to know a bit about the property management space because I've dealt with so many shitty property managers um, working yeah. in real estate. And, and it's so bad that I'll get a client uh, here in Southern California who's buying an investment property. And they're like, oh, hey, by the way, Scott, do you know a property manager you can refer me to? And I'm like, absolutely not. They all suck. Everyone mm. I've ever dealt with is horrible. Um, mm. Either their fees are too high or their service is too low or whatnot. But I'm guessing with the scale of the business that you have, you're doing something right. So maybe we just start there. Like what, what is a good property management company? And may, maybe the deeper question is what are you doing to run a good scalable company? Yeah. Wow. Let's just go right there. So that is more often what I hear is realtors don't refer management companies, uh, lenders, title bankers. Um, we do not have a great reputation in the industry. I've considered Branding as an asset manager, not a property manager. Haven't mm -hmm. having gone that far yet, but uh, we're pretty close. So there, yeah, you need to understand where property management came from. Great Depression hits. The banks take on properties. The banks aren't going to manage the properties. They're entering property managers. And for a while, I think things were fine. They had very consistent fees. They would charge one month's rent to place a tenant. They're usually going to be a department that's that's bolted onto a real estate brokerage. <clears throat> and then software comes out like 15, 20 years ago that allows entrepreneurs like myself to manage a ton of real estate from an accounting perspective, the books perspective. And we're like thinking that this is a really good business model, like how hard this could be. Maybe, maybe you owned a rental property or two, maybe you're a realtor and, and your clients want you to manage it and you don't know who to refer and you're thinking that could be some residual income. And the challenge is, is that the software will help you with, with, with scaling the books and the work orders and things like that, but it still takes a lot of people to manage properties well. And the margins are higher in a good real estate cycle for, for the brokerage side. And then those that are really good at managing properties at a certain point, why wouldn't they want to just develop them themselves or own the, 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 the real estate? They would get the depreciation, the, the appreciation, the cash flows, not just this. Uh, it's almost like an insurance policy for is what we charge. You, know, you charge a percent of the rent and you got to figure out. So what we discovered is that I'm not, I'm, yes, to the public, I'm a property management company, but behind the scenes, we're a logistics company. And we need to understand a couple key metrics. Because if you were to ask me, well, how's the business running well? Or how's it running today? I would have to look at it almost like a bell curve. Like, what's the worst stuff that's going on right now on the high end or on the low end? And like, where is my averages? So when we look at metrics like economic occupancy, which are really reserved for like the larger multifamily players where like you're really honing in on like, you're, you're, you're coming up with your rental prices based upon square footage and there's algorithms and all this, but you can do it on a smaller scale for somebody like myself that manages 
you know, about 500 to 1,000 doors in each office that has, you know, decent systems to train staff and retain staff. Economic occupancy, Scott, allows you to like hone right in on the top line of the income statement, which is rental income. So that factors vacancy and collections. And then with that, with, with that one equation, which would be market rent versus what you rented it for, then you, then you deduct anything for collections. So a $1,000 a month rental would bring in $12,000 a year. How much do we actually collect? Did we get 1150 or 11,500? Did we get 12,000? Like, where did we end up? Did, did some maintenance go on and we lost the tenant? I've had that happen to me before. Sewer pipe broke on the same tenant's bed twice within two weeks. And we lost that tenant. And uh, the economic occupancy for that one unit wasn't great that year. So if you can get the economic occupancy for the top line and then figure out some good metrics for the bottom line, like how fast can you get a unit turned? From move out to move in, how quick are you, right? How quickly can you respond to tenants and measure those? My, my integrator can work with each of our offices and then drive those few metrics. I'm fortunate enough that I started with some real estate. I understand the pain of a vacancy. I understand the pain of a tenant not paying rent. And we haven't always been a very good management company. We've we expanded too fast. Um, I was pretty early in in GoBundance. It was like 2014. Uh, a lot of the GoBros wanted to bolt on a rent well to their to their uh, real estate brokerages. Um, you know, I wanted to say yes and figure it out later. And 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 uh, uh, we can get into to, to some of that. Some things that we went through. So the whole, hopefully, uh, I was a little well, succinct. Ready, fire, aim. <laughs> <laughs> Aim, fire, and get ready up until the point that bullet's going to hit. Just keep getting ready for that next thing, right? Yep, yep. But that's what we do, right? We build the plane as we're flying it and that, yeah, that kind of thing. So um, I'm more passionate about property management now. I don't cringe when my phone rings. I manage a lot of my buddy's real estate. Before, I'd be like, oh, my God, I don't really want to answer this phone. So, so um, we're steady. We're in business a decade. We don't do brokerage, so we stay focused. And we also stopped marketing and we track how often are our existing clients buying more real estate. And if they're buying more real estate, we're doing some things right. And if they're churning more uh, outside of, of the macro level of, of, of what, what rental units are selling for and accidental landlords selling their properties, if they're churning a little too much, uh, then that's when we, um, we need to need to continue to tighten some things up. It's not the sexiest business. I don't recommend it for everybody. It's done well for myself and my family, my team. Um, we like our services side. That's a what to get back to the software. The software will help you out so much, but it it yeah it, it'll tell you what plumbers available maybe. But like, do you even have them in your database? Like, what right. if they don't answer? Like, like it's still very people intensive. Um, you know how to fix the leak, but did you did you did the property manager or maintenance coordinator think that also now the ceiling needs to get repaired? And hey, look, we got to get rid of that hot water heater that the that the vendor just uh, you know set on the back porch because their van was too full. So like you really need to see some things through. So that's one of the reasons we do landscaping in house. So like, you mentioned yeah. this that you have you know four different offices. It's very labor intensive. Is it labor intensive because you have to have a cadre of people, you know, working overnight to take the one o'clock call when the toilet floods? Or is it labor intensive because you have to have people in markets to go out and see that there's a hot water heater that got left behind that's just cluttering up the property, making it look dirty and potentially bring down rets? Like, like if you can automate a certain amount of logistics companies or you, you can automate a certain amount of the logistics with software, where does the, where does the people power come from? Yeah. So you're going to have the the office staff and and the field management staff. That there's there's people there and there's bookkeepers and accountants keeping the whole thing whole thing moving. And one property manager, depending on how many clients they have and how many rental properties they manage, usually the metrics are around seventy five 
doors per full-time staff member, and that's office staff. 75 doors per, per employee member. time employee. Got it. Got so it. if you're if you're running 750 doors on a staff of 10 people, um, you're pretty good. Like if you're running it well, you could try to stretch it to in the 80s or, or even the hundreds. Um, there are some firms out there that are building their own software platform so they can manage more properties with less people. But I don't know if those software platforms are actually doing a better job. The client cares about very few things, but when those few things aren't getting done, you're, you're going to hear about it. Right. Um, so we what we've done is we've centralized accounting, HR, reporting, br- uh, the branding. We, we've centralized some of the hiring and some of like the metrics and 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 then we've we place in in an office local property managers that are physically in that market they have field managers right cuz then you get into this efficient are you being efficient or are you being effective and like what's that mixture of both tell tell so us the difference some- tell us the difference yeah, so- for somebody that's new to business yeah, so so efficient would be, wow, I'm just going to have one person that's going to be the property manager. They're going to do everything for it. And that one owner will call them and they're going to know everything about the property. And then that's like really effective. That's like super that's like that's like super effective, but it's not efficient because like great, I'm in the office in the morning and I'm following up on who hasn't paid rent, but then I got to go to the eviction later on. And then there was a then, then, then a tenant moved out. So I got to do a video for them and then meet with some vendors and all that. So it's like incredibly effective. That's how most people manage the real estate. They, they kind of do it all themselves. That starts to break down at like the 10 to 15 unit mark where they start to realize like, I can't do this. So the, uh, the, uh, the effective balance versus the efficient is like there's whole courses around that for, for this industry, whether you're going to grow portfolio based or department based. So what we found is some, some office staff that are in front of the computer, in front of the phones, nine to five, then some field staff that, that don't mind knocking on somebody's door and doing the walkthrough 60 days after they've moved in. That's like one of the biggest things we do that not a lot of my, um, uh, I would, I would call them competitors or, or just other people in the industry do is we physically, we just, put more eyes on the real estate. Wait, so because we're so yeah. after somebody moves in, you guys do like a 60 day health and wellness check or walk through the property. Yep. Yeah. And and is what there are, a mattress in the basement? Did they take down the smoke detectors? Got What's it. up with the dog cage? There's no pets allowed here. Why haven't why hasn't the trash been taken out? Like like those are the types of things that we're looking for. It takes a very unique individual that that is willing to do that. Uh, and then there's other individuals that are willing to, you know, text somebody and get on the phone when, when, when uh, a tenant's behind on their late or, or behind on their rent or, or like spend some time with a new owner to understand this new accounting system that's keeping track of their rents and what to, what's a trust accounting and portfolio reserve. So it just takes a wide range of personalities and skill sets to do it well. Most it's incredibly efficient and effective to manage your own real estate, but then you're, you've bought yourself a day job. At a certain point, you either need to hire staff that knows what they're doing to manage the portfolio, or you need to hire a property management company, or you can just n- not do either and go find a syndicator, right? Um, I left GoBundance for a few years and then I came back. And when I came back, it, it uh, big influence from, from, from bigger pockets, right? Like, Lots, of, lots of real estate. There was a lot before, right. like heavy real estate, um, lots of syndicators. I think it's pretty cool. I can get on that app and I can see all these different deals and deal flows. And, and um, yeah, I'm loving it. I'm loving it being back. So that's just a little bit about the, the property management space. When you get up to like four or 500 doors, if you don't start bringing in some of your own maintenance, you're really going to have a hard time. And that's where you need a handyman. Um, you don't need to do your own landscaping. We, we, the universe opened that up to us with the pandemic, right? Like it literally like, like called out to me. It was like, Hey dude, like, I, I'm not going to send you any more signals. Just go do this. I know it sounds crazy, um, but you're going to, you like this year you're doing your own landscaping division. 
You know, this is interesting because right before we got on the call, you used a term which I think is like a big buzzword right now in the business world, especially with, you know, the biggest logistics company in the world being Amazon, this idea of being fully integrated, right, or virtually fully integrated. Um, can you explain to people what vertically integrated means mm -hmm. and, and why vertical integration matters and why that's important to business and why that's such a big deal right now in the business space. What does, what does vertically integrated mean? In my space right now, I think, I think the, the technical term would be that you, whatever business you're in, you start to become like your own supplier to it. You, you look at the other vendors or people or, um, businesses that are required for you to do your job well. So a bakery might start doing something with their own grain or, or take on their own distribution, right? Uh, they may not start building their own ovens, but they would, you know, uh, do, do more parts of that, uh, of that log logistical chain. For us, what it looks like in the property management space is we, being a logistics company, when by becoming vertically integrated, which means that we are a licensed general contractor in the states that we operate, and that we have W-2 employees on our healthcare benefits, on our 401k, uh, on our apps, driving our vehicles, in our uniforms, and instead of the phone call from the property manager being like, hey, um, you know, get a work order in. Roof's leaking, grass hasn't been cut, whatever it might be. And they have to reach out to some vendors to hopefully get them to respond, right? Because I think we've all seen with this pandemic, like good luck getting anything done in your house nowadays. Right. It's expenses, supply chain issues, et cetera. Instead of us trying to like get these vendors to, to you know, be super polite, call us back and get out there to this property – we put in a work order and we just let that, we let our own employee know where to go and here's information to look for. And Oh, by the way, while you're there, why don't you check on this? So we're property managers that, that, that find guys that like to cut grass, but then we say, Hey, while you're there, check the gutters, check for some drainage things. Um, look on the front porch, just, just be the eyes and ears for us. And we started that in like April of last year and it's taken off like, like big time taken off. And that is a, one example of being vertically integrated. So now we are our own landscape company. We are our own HVAC company, our own construction company. We, ha we do our own unit terms and, and maintenance, uh, so we're more, we're more in control. We can manage more properties better. Yeah. And, and I, I've and got to imagine that helps the profit, right? Because if you're kind of cutting out the middleman of some of these vendors who, let's be honest, I, I can barely swing a hammer without destroying my own fingers. Um, but I think a business is a business is a business. If I had to open a contract, a construction company, it's like, well, I don't know. A contractor who calls their client back might crush it in this industry because in California, I'm sure it's the same through much of the country, good luck trying to get a contractor to call you back pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, doesn't matter. It's like it's like a nightmare. Like they just they most contractors don't have that business 101 acumen. So I'm guessing well, yeah. you can, you they can don't want to work for real it's not all of them want to work for a real estate investor. Why right. do somebody's bathroom for 12,000 bucks for a real estate investor if that's like and that might be a lot, right? Right. Uh, when you could do somebody's bathroom for 30 grand. Right. And like the tile's different. It's the same tub diverter. It's the same uh, same sheet of plywood, tongue groove, three-quarter inch that's going to go down on that floor. Same drywall. <clears throat> yeah. So it's not that they're necessarily even poor business owners. They're just like, why would I want to work for somebody who's – business it is to keep the costs low the rents high and coming in they're not in alignment so right. what we we don't necessarily earn more revenue or profit by doing this what we do is we have a lot less headaches which means a lot less turnover which means the the, the fewer my turning over the staff the longer the clients stay with us yeah 
And then there is some margin. The, the, the caveat to that is the vendors that do do well with landlords don't always have all the right paperwork and the landlords don't really care. They're not getting audited on workers comp. I do. Right. Right. At like a $2 million construction company. You better believe it. Like they're going to be looking at your books for workers comp and payroll taxes and all that. So then there's a segment of vendors that we can't use, but a landlord could use. Right. Right. And that's right. where it's, we're not always in alignment. So um, uh, my, my sales guy, uh, Sean has been with us for, for 10 years and he is the gatekeeper for whom becomes a client in our, in our main office, which is our Philadelphia office. And, and we, we got to have conversations around what, what are expectations around maintenance? What do things really cost? We rolled out something called a rent well one rate. So we charge a, to finish that story with the great depression, property management, uh, the software, then everybody started playing around with the rates they charge. Where it was like a general rate, you know, call it, everybody thinks it's like eight to 10% or whatever. But now there's this a la carte menu that you need to be an engineer to figure out what is my property management company even charging me? Do I even know where they're, where they make money, how they make money, how this thing is staffed? Here's this fee, that fee. You could go to a weekend course and, and they will teach you 300 different fees to charge vendors, tenants, this thing, that thing, clients. So, so what is, what is your one fee? Now I'm fascinated by this, right? Yeah. yeah so, yeah. so I'm, so I'm, for the average single family house, we're, we're about, we're in, in, for, for our, for this is East coast. So like a $2,000 single family house, we're going to manage for around $175 a month to $195 a month. I think that's where it is right now. And that includes tenant placement. Got it. Got it. So if my tenant moves out, you're going to find a replacement, flip the house, move them in for a hundred, for yeah. roughly 10%. That's right. Awesome. Versus, hey, uh, one firm's charging a half a month, one term, firm's charging a full month, one, term, one firm, oh, they renewed the lease, that's 500 bucks. Oh, you want us to be there for the township inspection, that's going to be $75. Uh, yeah. Yeah, just do, do it all, one flat fee, much easier. Yeah. What we found, Scott, is that after two years, when that tenant was ready to move, the clients were selling the real estate for that like one house. So here, here's what would happen. Now I need to pay. Now I'm going to have a month of vacancy. Now I'm going to have to do some painting, do some cleaning, right? Maybe the tenant didn't leave it in great shape. I got to do some extra landscaping. Now I have to pay the leasing commission, vacancy, and maintenance. Pff, I'm done with this. Let's just sell it. Got it. And then you lose an asset. Not, not so much the investors, but more what are called accidental landlords. Yeah. And so accidental- a lot of the. Accidental landlords, the person who inherits the house from mom is never moving back in there. They rent it out because whatever. They can't bring themselves to sell mom's house, but I'll make a couple thousand dollars a month. Or the person like me who bought one four unit is like, this is miserable. I, you know, it's like the first time somebody called me when I was a landlord because I, I didn't have professional management. And they're like, well, um, uh, yeah, we, we had to replace the, the light bulbs. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Thank, thanks for letting me know. Well, you know, it was $17. So can I take that off my rent? I'm like, are, are you fucking kidding me? I remember my dad replacing a hot water heater at a rental and just doing it and being like, well, we want hot water heater. Like may, maybe the landlord will, will reimburse us for it. Maybe he won't. But when I got that call, I was like, this is the worst gig ever. And it like soured me for like five or 10 years on owning real estate. Yeah. Brutal. Um, so wait, you got, you have four offices right now. Where, where are your field offices and kind of areas of, of uh, operation? Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Wilmington, Delaware, and, and Baltimore, Maryland. Ooh, Delaware, a hotbed of excitement and activity. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Delaware. <laughs> um, so, so tell us, uh, give us a couple of the, because the, I mean, this is your company. Give us a couple of the management, you know, uh, hits and misses of managing four offices. You know, get, give us, a, give us a, a greatest hit. Like, I'm so ex excited about this accomplishment. I've really grown as a leader and like, oh, man, I really fucked this up. <laughs> So uh, thankfully, I'm not managing them. Um, I have an integrator, a COO. He's equity partner, uh, my right hand man, uh, Mr. TJ Hawk, and he. I go. I do go abundance and uh, more. More that visionary. Uh, he likes uh, the COO Alliance. Is his mastermind group. He reads a lot. 
very steady, very methodical, very calm under pressure. Um, those are not attributes that I that have come to me naturally. I, I work on those daily. Uh, greatest opportunity. I hear. I'll give you one of why I like being vertically integrated. We buy a building. We buy a six unit building. So my specialty, Scott, is I buy multifamilies that need love. And in the Philadelphia region, these properties can be a hundred years old. Yeah. So they're old. They they've been run down. They need some love. They've been band aided for years. We go in. And we, we might buy a building for half a million bucks and put 700 into it. Woo. Um, yeah. That's like not, that's big, not, a, say that's not a little term. bit of TLC. That's rebuilding the building. We're rebuilding the building. We're, we're, we're all the water lines, the roof, um, you know, fresh paint everywhere, new driveways, new electrical uh, box, the whole nine. The whole nine. Absolutely. Yeah. Water meters everywhere. Um, so we get, we get them down to, 25, 28% operating expenses and the cap rates are, are pretty, pretty good here. Uh, so the numbers pencil out, they're big burr models. What I love about it being vertically integrated with this is we had a resident recently that did not want to move. She's in her seventies. She can afford a, a slight rental increase. And we got the township to agree based upon the investment in this building to, to take these irregular very long and narrow two bedrooms that would rent for $1,400 when renovated. We, all, we had enough parking to do two one bedrooms, really efficiencies, but we, we put doors on all of our bedrooms. So it's technically considered a one bedroom and she could afford the rent for that apartment. So we moved her to another one of our buildings around the corner and her three cats. We moved her, our crew moved her. She's been there for a few months. We're working on the building. She picked out which unit she wanted to rent. She loves the birds. She loves the view. Uh, she loves these big windows in, in, this, in, in this one apartment. And we're going to move her back there. Like that would be in nearly impossible for me to do as a third party manager. The landlord isn't face to face with this with this woman who's who's single, has their cats and like is is having a panic attack that that, you know, we're going to renovate her apartment. So that's a success story. Uh, I, I, I put a post up on that about like this is unconditional love right here. This made the, like the financial we are subsidizing her rent in another apartment because we want her to be our tenant and, and stay and not have to rock her world. And, and, and we know what the rents are out there. You're not going to find an apartment in this town anymore yeah. for, you know, under a thousand bucks. I don't care how big, uh, how, how big or how, how small it is. That's, that's a big win. And then I put a Facebook post up about that. And I tagged the foreman who like helped make this happen. We went to school together and then don't, you know, some haters get on the post and say, yeah, but rent well when my kicked my grandpa out and they didn't do this. This is BS. And da, 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 da. And I had to just let it sit. I had to just do it. And then I responded back like, look, I, you know, we have 2010 plus. I don't know about this exact scenario. Keep in mind, we're a third party manager. Sorry about your, your, your grandfather. Um, you know, and then uh, some other people got my back on that one. I'm like, yo, dude, stop, stop. They don't know. So I bring that up because even these wins, um, they're, they're, it's not that they're fleeting, but they're interpreted differently by different people. Right. And you just have to know what your Michael's one of Michael Singer's recent talks. He talked about what are your intentions and under really understanding your intentions. And um, there's more stories like that, like that we've done with that, um, with that resident. And it's part of our marketing. We do direct mail to find these buildings. And we say we that's one line that says, like, we will work with your tenants. If you have some different relationships, we have another one who's he's 96 years young. He loves to build puzzles. He's been there for years. Um, you know, we're going to we're going to do our best to work with that resident. Uh, while also remaining fiscally sound to be able to continue to renovate these buildings and all that. So that's a win. I, I love that Gosh. balance, by the way, because, you know, um, I, I choose the mortgage company that I work for because they're doing good things to give back in the community. And they also balance that with, hey, let's be honest, like 
bad things happen to good companies who don't make money. So we have to balance that, you know, we're a for-profit company. Yes. We're, we're not all public school teachers here trying to save the manatees. And when we have windfall profits, you know, our CEO, instead of, as you probably know, mortgage companies just had the best two years ever in the history of banking. <laughs> and instead of buying a yacht or putting his name on the side of a, you know, football stadium or something like that, which is ironic because he played tight end in the NFL, he donated $100 million of money that should have gone to him to our to our charitable wing. And they're going to build inner city schools, charter schools at like the communities that need them the most. And, you know, they're digging wells all over the world um, to get fresh water to people. And I'm like, dude, this this is the balance of like, hey, they're not giving away the house. Clearly, there was $100 million of profit, but there's also a way to give back to the things that matter. And I, I, I love that balance that you just described. So, uh, so get, give us a big failure, man. It's been, it's been 10 years. I know you guys bought a building that you got your ass kicked on or, you know, whatever. You, you showed up after one too many drinks and, like, lost a client or so, something horrible had to happen in 10 years of running this crazy business because I know property management is not easy. There's been deaths. There's been suicides. Oh. Uh, there's been some really sad cases of child abuse. In the, in the obviously in the units that you manage and do you guys get brought in for that stuff like are police looking for testimony from you guys and oh that's brutal it testimony but it could be leases um, when somebody passes away and it's figuring out the next of kin and having uncomfortable conversations I'm sorry I can't let you in this apartment and take anything that you want um, <laughs> you know you have to go through a process for that software is not figuring that out for you right and experience is what you get just after. You needed it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, learn how to deal with that situation after you just had to deal with it. Great. Yeah, so there, it's life. So uh, last week, one of my investors, uh, I set up joint ventures to do these big buildings because I want to do you know four or five of these buildings a year. Makes for a nice return for the investors. Um, they, you know, the, one, the one does a little powwow with me. He's an executive at, 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 at a big bank. He's getting ready to retire. And... We went through an apartment building in an opportunity zone area. So I'll leave it at that. It's an opportunity zone area. Yep. And and we get back in my truck. And he says, wow. He's like, I would have never been in this neighborhood. I would have never, ever walked through that apartment building. I would have no reason to. He's like, I just got a little, I got a, a, a different slice of life. And being a landlord and then being a property manager, I don't see it as much now with four offices and, and all these. My, 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 my job is different of how I need to show up as the leader for this company. Uh, but I do get out there and you see different slices of life. And it can be a very humbling experience. It can be a very frustrating experience. Uh, there's been times I wanted to call, looking at a piece of property buying, I wanted to call Child Protective Services. Uh, with the pandemic, they were delivering food. The school districts around here were, were bringing the food to the to the children's doorstep that were enrolled because that's how they were going to get lunch that day. And uh, knowing that they moved out and that food was just sitting there and then trying to track down how to, how to like let them know, I don't know where they moved to, but they moved out and... So you, um, you have to become emotionally not – the word isn't soft or tough or, or hardened. This is life. This is the cross-section of life. You are not the general manager. You are not God. This is how some people live. Be grateful. There's a prison 12 minutes from my house. And before the pandemic, I, I, would, I would teach a meditation class there. And uh, I would get to go home. And those inmates were still there. So it's a humbling um, where it can show up negatively for me is with my children, because one of my fears has been, Scott, that I, I didn't want them to be spoiled growing up because I didn't feel like I was. And uh, we, we, we have an abundant life. Um, my, my wife came here from Romania with just a few hundred dollars. Um, we, we live in a nice big house. We're in one of the you know, wealthiest communities in Chester County and yada, yada, yada. And, and uh, so that's unfortunately for me where it could show up is what do you mean? You're not going to finish your meal. Like I was just at a place there's, there's cupboards are empty. 
Um, so the old, you know, they're starving in Africa. Why aren't you eating here? Right. So I've had to, I've had to work through a lot of that stuff and, and, and recognize when the tape is playing in my own mind, pull myself back. I do a lot of prayer. I do a lot of meditation to center myself. Um, so the, uh, that, that can be, now it's a superpower and it's a strength, uh, but there's just some, you see life uh, murders. I, I, good, good buddy. I mean, it was after father's day. I think it was two years ago. I, I was in that tenant's property b- a month before because the, my buddy wanted to sell the house and he's like, yeah, man, it's dangerous around here. And this and that, and I want to get out and this and that murdered by a family member after father's day. This is how I think it went down the, like, the, on the, the steps. The person who was in the, in the, uh, yeah. one of the tenants or the owner, one of our tenants. Oh, Murdered after a family event from an altercation. Family member followed him home, murdered him on his porch. Girlfriend, wife, baby mama gets shot as well. Oh, like, like, and now I'm the manager. <laughs> my, my buddy wants to sell this house. You, you know, that's not worth the hundred dollars a month to do it, but you do it. And, 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 and now it's like you do it because it's service and who else is going to do it? My buddy can't, you know, he's not going to manage that situation. So it's, it's, it's real life. It's um, it's, it's an interesting cross section of life. Yeah. Cause every, and, everything happens at home, right? The highs, the lows, like you mentioned, the, the horrific stuff that happens in our society, the spousal abuse, the child abuse, the suicide, the drug use, you know, um, all of this stuff happens in the home. And this is what you guys are managing. And it's a small percentage but it's enough that four years ago, we were in my, at my home at a summit, and I asked, there were probably 20 Rentwell team members there. And I said, who all wants to own real estate as an investment? How many hands do you think went up? Oh. Zero. Not a single hand went up. And it, I was like, whoa, wasn't expecting that. Okay. They don't see the appreciation. They don't see the depreciation. They don't see the cash flow. They're, the staff is dealing with the hardest parts. If you manage 200 rental units and you have 5% that aren't paying that month, that's, that's what you're working on. Those clients are frustrated. What's going on? I want my updates. Yada, yeah. yada, yada. Yeah. If you're doing 30 move outs in August, a uh, busy time for move outs, you're not focusing on the 20 five that actually moved out on time and left the keys there you're focused on the three that are still there the one that got broken into the one who left the windows open and blah 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 um the one who flushed so, concrete down the toilet on the way out because they were just bitter yeah i had one tenant that owner wasn't respectful to him they 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 took the bathroom like the whole bathroom there was literally like two risers sticking out and and like a drain so on this shirt that says freedom is every team member's name and what we started to do was when as we buy a building, we will carve out 10% of our own cash flows and we will award them as an acorn because an acorn grows into an oak tree. So now they have a profit share in a in a cash flowing property. They get to see it. We do quarterly distributions. And now we're starting to educate our team and it's starting to shift. We're also starting to attract team members that are more interested in in real estate and real estate investing, which is cool. Yeah, call and, lined up with. Yeah. And, so. Well, and now that you're vertically integrated, I've got to imagine. You know, you said this kind of really took off in the last year or two. Um, between staff that you have on premises, vertically vert, vertically integrated staff members, team members, third party, co- like how many people are on your team? There's like like fifty some people. Yeah, that's a lot of people to manage, man. I can barely manage myself. Yeah. I know. <laughs> well, it, well, it's the old, you know, lead people, you know, manage systems. But again, not my forte. Right. Uh, credit goes to credit, credit goes to my partner. Uh, uh, credit goes to the general managers and the property managers. And we're just, you know, we're blessed. But but this is like 12 years in, 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 in the making to get here to have some energy to to be to be to be hanging with you on, on, on this, I probably wouldn't have even accepted this, you know, shit five years ago. Uh, uh-uh, right. I won't talk about this. Right, right. You know, yeah. we, we we talked about some massive changes in your life over the last, you know, five or ten years. Uh, do you mind talking about some of those? 
Yeah, yeah. So I, I know that you've been in a in a twelve step program for a long time. Uh, I don't I don't know what the term is in recovery, sober, whatever, whatever, whatever yeah. the the the, tune, the term de jour is. Um, uh, what happened? Yeah. So I I grew up no trauma that I was aware of. Right, grew up parents were self employed. Um, yeah, mom would stay at home. And to the, the best of my knowledge, life was just kind of hard. Life wasn't a lot of fun. Um, and then in high school, I got high and I loved it. Like some of my friends did too. And they loved it. Some loved it more than me. Some probably aren't around anymore. And I, But I really enjoyed it. It slowed down. What it did for me was it allowed me to fit in. Then I'd have a drink. Um, and it wasn't a problem, really. Like it wasn't really a problem or so I thought. Yeah. Famous last words by every addict I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to later on in life, a literally voice in my head said, this is going to end badly. So I picked it up in high school. I mean, I'm, I'm honor student. I'm, I'm, I'm still, I'm straight A's, you know, AP classes and all that. I have a landscaping company. I, I, I you know, at that time I buy, I'm buying my own vehicle. I'm very independent. Um, uh, my parents confronted me on it. I put it down, had no clue what a 12 step was, no idea, no idea what it would mean for any of this stuff. Put it down, focused on the business, went to Penn State, picked it up again, and then woke up in like junior year, sophomore year and was like, wait a minute, wait, a minute, what am I doing? What am I doing? These guys in this fraternity house have banking relationships through their parents. They have this, they have that. I was pretty much on, on, on my own. Uh, I didn't have my landscaping business anymore. I had sold that to help pay for college. And then I became fascinated with this one company. And I, all the classes I took, I focused on that company. And I, and I, and I put down the partying. Because at that time, Scott, that's what it was. It was just partying. Right. Maybe I partied a little bit more than some of the others. Maybe, may, may, maybe less. There was always somebody that seemed like they could drink or do this or do that. And uh, never really any hard, hard stuff. So... Then I become this energy that I have of like this survival, like this rich dad, poor dad, this think and grow rich, this, this, um, you know, make friends and influence people. And, and uh, I would just work like I worked. I bought, I bought some properties and I worked. And um, then I got an e-myth coach and then I met one of the elders of Go Abundance. And, and I was at, I think, the January winter mastermind of 2014. And um, still was like, wasn't using, wouldn't drink much, would get a stomach, it would bother me. And then, then life started to become a little bit more difficult. Had a son whom, um, uh, you know, our medical industry does certain things at, at certain months when they're younger, right? And uh, he became really sick because of it. And had needed to go to feeding clinics and basically became autistic. Um, and he's on a spectrum right now. He's doing very well. He's almost 10 years uh, old. Uh, very well. Needs some help with school and things like that. Uh, then mom dies. Then like life, like this wasn't stuff on my vision board, right? Like this wasn't all my life plan when you use Go Abundance terms. And then, then the business really expanded. Wait, your, your mom died or your child? My mom, mom passed away. Oh, your mom yep, passed yep, away. Sorry, okay, my okay. mom passed away. Okay. Um, daughter's born with Down syndrome. We went forward with that pregnancy. So ba basically like, and I'm just working and I'm not thinking that there's anything wrong with the voice in my head. It was just like, it was just telling me what to do and I would just go do it. I had no spirituality. I had no God. I had no higher power. It was all me. And I had been white knuckling life for like years. So then I'm, I'm literally, um, I'm, I'm hanging out with a friend. I'm like, Hey man, give me, give me some of that. Right. Cause I knew that he liked, he, he liked to smoke. And, and, and meanwhile, marijuana is like pretty much legal now, almost everywhere right. you go. Right. I'm like, Hey, it's legal. This is going to be all right. But a voice in my head said, this is going to end badly. And what happened to me is it worked. When I would get high, the voice in my head would be calm. I could show up and be a dad for my kids on the weekends. I wouldn't be thinking about work. I would just be sledding or riding bikes where I had energy, boundless amounts of energy. Um, 
But then it wasn't just take a hit on Sunday night. It was like, okay, a little earlier on Sunday, you know, and then it became Saturday, but then it's Friday after work. Right. And then there's a, there's a phrase in the 12 steps that says you, we, we couldn't live with or without them. And it doesn't matter what the substance is. I could be saying the same thing about gambling, eating, um, any, basically anything on the outside. For me, the addiction was work for many years. It was work and then it was fitness and then it's this. And then it was what's, how many LinkedIn followers do I have? How many Facebook followers do I have? Like whatever, the disease of more. We say one is too many and a thousand is never enough. Right. So I had to hit a rock bottom to wake up. And what's crazy yeah. about this to me is like, usually I don't know why I attract friends that are addicts and I was probably an addict at some point in my life or whatever. Um, it, it's usually the story goes, I started using in high school. I used all through college. I used all through my twenties. Then it got really bad in my thirties. And then I, in, insert rock bottom, you know, DUI crashed, hit my wife, whatever, in my 40s, and then I realized I had to get sober. And the, and the timing's always different, but it seems to be on this never-ending continuum where with you, it seemed like, ah, I picked it up, I put it down, I picked it up, I put it down. And then what's the what's the time frame where it becomes a real fucking problem? Is it 18 yeah. months, two years, five years? It seemed to go pretty quick. What they say is that it's, it's uh, although I was able to put it down, that disease, if you will, and then um, why it's called a disease is that it's fatal. Yep. It's, it's incurable. Right. Uh, and it's, and it's, and, and, and you can't take medicine to like deal with this. Right. So that's why it's called disease because I could, we could do a whole podcast. Why they call it disease or this nomenclature, or that nomenclature. And I want to be careful that I don't break any of the traditions of a 12 step. Right. Cause they are anonymous programs. Right. Yeah. So, that's where it's uh, – but if they were completely anonymous, Scott, nobody would ever know about them, and a lot of people would be in a world of hurt. Right. I mean, I could – you can pick a fellowship, go around the country. There's there's, there's meetings, meetings, meetings. That's okay. So, yeah, it is a little unique. Um, so then uh, I had to get over, like, do I fit in? Um, you know, I'm using my, – my, my drug of choice is, is, is not what everybody's drink or drug is or whatever, um, everybody's rock bottom is different. And what it is, is it's not about the substance. It's about a train of thought. It's about like, it lives in the mind. And then, so it was, it was pretty quick, but it, 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 it lasted long enough. I mean, I'd have to ask my mom about exact dates and or my, not my mom, but, but my wife, cause she knew something was up. Um, and then I tried to stop on my own. I did, I, Again, for a little bit, it would get worse. Um, a doctor recommended that, like, hey, it might be good if you could just limit this and control it because you do have a lot going on. You know, Mr. Coldwell, this business and that thing and these kids and that and like, oh, my gosh. But but thankfully, I hit a rock bottom. And I just stopped digging. My own rock bottom and I asked for help and I went to my wife. I said, I need some help. I need help. And she was talking to a dear friend and uh, they had an intervention. Like it was an intervention. It was an intervention that I asked for yeah. with trained counselors. And then um, I tried to do it for like a few days on my own. And the energy that was building up, um, I couldn't handle. And then I, I, I went to a meeting and uh, started to get some help and started to see some medical professionals, was offered medicine. Uh, tried the medicine and it made my brain so foggy. I remember doing it, uh, doing a releasing session uh, with this one, with this one coach, I forget the guys, uh, the, the name of the releasing technique, but you basically make peace with whatever it is that you're um, fearful of. Right. Uh, because, or anything that you want, because anything you want, you don't have, if you want peace or love, well, then you naturally don't have it because you want right. it. <laughs> so, I, I, then I get off the medicine and it's been, it's been, I mean, we're talking half a decade here. Yeah. So it's the best I can honestly say. I wish it would have happened to me sooner. I wish that I would have known about it. It's one of the reasons I'm willing to break my anonymity. The closest people in my, in my world know this about me. Right. Um, because the fear is, will people, will people not want to hire the company? 
Um, even though I'm not the company, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a part of it. I'm a figurehead for it. You know, I'm, I'm its biggest champion. Well, people not want to invest in my deal, like fear stuff. Why not be accepted? Right. Why not do this? Why not be that? Uh, and I looked around and, um, the people that really know me the most know, I'd like to say this and I'll shut up, put it down and hand the mic back to you. So one of our, one of my first deals where I brought in outside investors, cause we did a lot of the stuff ourselves. Then we bring in outside investors and we come to the end of the project and I return half of their capital and there's still an equity on the deal. He knows that I work a 12 step. Uh, and he says, I'm not interested in the same deal because I was telling him about a different deal. And I'm, oh man, you know, the voice in my head telling me, talking to me, talking not nice things to me. It's since become very calm and very peaceful. And I would offer any of your listeners, like there is a way out. I promise you doesn't need to be a 12 step. And like, like there's ways um, that life does not need to be suffering and struggle. Like it can be really joyous and free. And um, I just went neutral and I said, okay, well tell me, tell me what that means. He says, yeah, that was a hundred thousand dollar investment. And I, you know, you, you did phenomenal on it, the project, but uh I want to do a million, a uh, half a million dollars minimum, and I, I just want some more equity on the next project. And I'm like, okay, let me see what I can do. Let me see what I can find. You know, so, um, you know, what is there left to fear but fear yourself type deal? What, why I brought this up because we could have talked about almost a lot of different things is when you put out the opportunity to jump on here. Um, and I responded and then you, 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 you email back and we picked the time. I said, okay, let me, let me just do some re more research on Scott. I mean, there's 500 guys in go abundance, right? You, yeah. you just, and uh, you put out a podcast, you put out one of your episodes recently and you said that you lost some friends with this pandemic. And I think one maybe went, went to the gym a lot and one, one with church was their thing. And uh, you know, listen to that whole episode, but that really stayed with me. And this is just part of my life story. This is part of my journey. I hope I, uh, I hope I stay with the 12 steps. It's a, it's an operating system for my life. It's a spiritual, not religious program. And, and what it's, what it's done is there's no certificate that you get. You don't graduate. Right. You, you it's not something you get. It's something you do. And I've brought that through all areas of my life. See why I, before I just thought, oh, get to get to three thousand units and six offices, and you'll be there, man. You 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 got this thing, right? No, dude. Like, just get to one hundred and seventy five pounds, twelve percent body fat, and do a GB nine, whatever number. You got this. No, this wealth is something you do. Health is something you do. Relationships are something you do. Unconditional love is something you do, and and that's what this this program has taught me. That's why I keep coming back. That's why I'm willing to share it without breaking. Hopefully the program's anonymity. I want to be really careful around those traditions. I totally get it. Um, uh, you know, it may not work for me forever in terms of for me, or I might not work it. If I stop working, if I stop going, um, I know what the patterns are in my, in my mind. I mean, my mindset has said some pretty mean things to me. Yeah. And uh, that's also when I found Michael Singer. And that's been a big part of my journey, spending some time with him reading his book, studying his stuff. Then I've gotten into the yogis, Ramana Maharshi and um, um, Yoganandu, and they've written books. And, and, and that's what my, my prayer and meditation is, the knowledge of God's will, the power to carry that out, and just showing up, being present. That's why I actually really like this format of podcasting, because we're both present here. We're not, I know you're not, I'm not, I'm not thinking about the next thing going on. I'm not thinking about that other email. I'm not thinking about putting the kids to bed or what's tomorrow. What's that? It's like, we're fully present in the moment. And this is where human connection, you know, get, gets built. I so I, I'm honored to be here. Thank you for letting me share that part. Hopefully I haven't broken any traditions. Um, you know, haters no, are going to hate, but you know, you, you said something in there, which I think is, you know, when you think of the typical, you know, movie addict, and again, doesn't matter what the drug of choice is, gambling, sex, drugs, alcohol, whatever, you know, you think of this low life who's down on their luck and whatnot. And, and I think you kind of hinted at it that, you know, success can mask a lot of those problems. 
you know, you, you look at somebody that's crushing it in their business industry. They're part of this, this men's group that's bringing in tens of millions of dollars in investment and they're down to 17% body fat because they're fucking running triathlons on the, on the weekend. The last thing that you would think about is like, ooh, that dude's got some fucked up shit in his head just like the rest of us and, and he's an addict. He's struggling with this thing. So I imagine for you, whatever your rock bottom is where you finally reached out for help, that success of owning a landscaping you know, company in your teenage years, making it through Penn State, building these businesses, like that success masks a lot of problems. Sure does. People telling you, yeah, you'll be a millionaire. I'll be a millionaire. Like this, like, uh, um, the other, the other reason, uh, there's a, there's a book, it's called, uh, the gap in the game, Dan, Dan yeah. Sullivan. Yeah. And then I was, I, I listened to him on a, on an interview that was done by front row dads and somebody, or at some point they brought up what's going on with suicide in, in high schools. It's not the, it's not the, uh, C student that's ending their life. It's 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 not the one that's just going through. It's not the proverbial normals. This is these are the these are the ones that are I th- that I don't want to minimize what's going on at all. And I'm not, but it just struck me when he said like these are the ones that you think would not do that. Right, right. These are and, the A student star quarterbacks. You know, Instagram following, destined yeah. for USC football. They're they're the ones that are killing themselves because the stress is just overwhelming at that age, and they're and they're measuring themselves against the ideal, which is what the book teaches. Stop measuring yourself against the ideal. There's a time and a place for that. Measure yourself against the gains that you've made, and that's what happened. I had th- I had it. It's like I had it. I had three thousand units. We were you know I'm making more money than I uh, than I used. Like I'm paying my tax bill is what my average friends making at that point, and they're like. But I don't feel any different. That like I'm still me. I'm still the soul, the atman, the observer of the voice, the observer of the body, the observer of the emotions. But I didn't have any of that knowledge that now I have. Yeah. So I can yeah. be more at peace. I can show up better. I have a lot more energy because that's what we are. We're like batteries. Uh, I can relate to many of the world's religions. Um, and 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 be on different levels with different people, so that's uh, that struck me also. So your podcast mentioning about these, uh, you know, rest I rest in peace to these. I've lost uh, uh, many my uh, many myself, many friends, um, and then I heard about these high school students and like, man, it's just it's really sad. Like on this plane, for for a lot of people, mind is more powerful than God. Yeah, I, I I wonder if in some ways, you know, you talk about the the star student who has it all together or, or you know, I, I mentioned the the businessman. I, I wonder almost like the this this is gonna sound chauvinistic or something, but the the curse of the alpha male, like how much harder is it to ask for help and and face that stigma of being an addict when you do have shit together in all these other areas, right? Because I imagine there was a bunch of self-talk and fear of like, I'm going to go ask for help and my wife, my friends, the counselor is going to be like, dude, Rob, what's the big deal? You're managing this office. You've got your shit together here. You're running triathlons or you're doing whatever with your health. Like, mm-hmm. what the fuck do you mean do you need help with this addiction thing? Like, like it's, it's almost being successful in all these other areas is self-sabotaging for us as men to be able to ask for help in the areas where we suck. The first step of any 12 steps is surrender. This is not what I was taught in school. This was not think and grow rich. This was not rich dad, poor dad. What do you mean surrender? (laughs) What do you mean surrender to win? The landscaping business was started from surrender to win. Like vendors aren't calling us back. Uh, Grass starting to grow. Couldn't get permits done. Like construction stopped. Was not deemed essential. But then I'm driving up my driveway and my landscaping guys are taking care of my lawn in the neighbor's yard. And he pulls out a bag of cash and he's like, this is this is amazing. My phone's ringing off the hook. Amazing. And I'm like, OK, OK, I get it. I w- we will do this. The idea had been ruminating. So that's the thing. It's like that's what I really uh, enjoy learning about. And that's why I like the book, The Un. The untethered soul, but 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 really, what I would recommend is starting with the surrender experiment because it goes through 
Mickey's first realization that what is this voice in my head? Then he start. Then he tries to, um, like, meditate off the voice in his head, and he and he and he and he tries all these things and get away from people and go down to Mexico. He tried some drugs, right? And then right. he he stopped then. That that because uh, that's what's tricky, right? I like. I, I still like. I would like to get high. I wish I could. Um, socially, I have. I can't. I do a lot of visit. A lot of people I know. Uh, we'll we'll do it. A lot of people will have a drink. For me, it just doesn't work well with my body, and I don't need it to have the energy that I want to feel. I need to be disciplined in other areas. But it justified it for me when like these yogis aren't doing. It. I thought all these yogis did it. Right. Right. Like I thought it was like this uh, medical thing. And look, for some people, and they want to do like the 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 DMT, the ayahuasca. They want to go down to Brazil. Hey, good. Hey, man, if that works for you, the plant medicine stuff works for you. Awesome. Right. For me, it's a really, it's a simple program. It starts with surrendering. It starts that I don't know everything. I need help. And I'm going to, I'm going to ask for help. And I'm going to turn my will and my life over to the care of a higher power. That's some, that is not what was taught to me. I don't blame the school districts. I don't blame my parents. I don't blame anything. It's just not the norm of where we are. But when I look at the norm of where we are, I don't, I don't see really a lot of parts of society or, or when I start to talk to people, how's things going? And that's what these masterminds, I'm in four different mastermind groups. I, I actually get to know people and I get to see what they're going through. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you start to get to know them on a deeper level. And um, anything on the outside is not going to give you peace on the inside. But when you have the peace on the inside, that outside world is pretty fun. You know, talking about the piece on the inside, before we started recording, we were talking about the book, The Untethered Soul by uh, Michael Singer. Amazing book, and I know he's got a bunch of uh, uh, precursors and follow-ups. That's kind of like one of his seminal works right in the middle of his authorship. I love that book, and my, my biggest takeaway from that is that voice in your head. I can't remember exactly how he describes it, but it effectively being a roommate you hate and a roommate that you don't really respect and is just constantly criticizing you. And it's probably a throwaway line in the book, but he effectively says, would you ever give that much credence to just some, you know, uh, my words, not his, asshole roommate who's just living there, just like hammering you nonstop. Eventually you would just tune him out. And sometimes that's what we got to do to the voices in our head. Sometimes it can be very valuable to listen to those voices, but that idea of disconnecting, and I can't remember the terminology he uses, but the disconnecting from that voice that's just constantly shitting on us. Um, mm. It's 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 such a powerful book and, and we were talking about, it, so I'm, I'm interested in your takeaways from Michael Singer's work and, uh, you mentioned his book, Surrender, I think it's called. Um, what, what are some of your takeaways from The Untethered Soul and, and other, other works by Michael Singer? The reverence that I have for this man is pretty deep. Uh, I had the opportunity to go down to his temple. And he, once things open back up, really, you just you, you can go down there. It's called the Temple of the Universe in Alachua, Florida. The The... the so for me, the, the 12 steps are, uh, are an operating system for life. Uh, the untethered soul supports it 100%. So you could have that as your own operating system for life. The roots of these things are, are really in the yogis. He, he, he says he's a Jewish yogi who loves Christ. And uh, Not a contradiction was, at all, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's been really great for me because – with my religious background, Roman Catholic, a lot of the things I didn't uh, agree with in school, I would get in trouble for asking questions. And, and uh, he's brought, there's a, there's an amazing book called uh, wisdom, Jesus, which retranslates the Beatitudes. What does it mean to be the blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth? What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that the poor, the physical poor it doesn't mean don't live with abundance. What it means is the meek means those that aren't letting the egoic mind run the show. Those meek, there's a there's a there's a there's a parable where this this overzealous student goes to the Zen master and says, I, I listen, and I studied this and I've been to those Himalayas and I that was my master and this is my guru. And 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 the Zen master just starts pouring pouring tea into his cup and then the, the cup starts to overflow. And the student doesn't realize it because he's not really present to it. He's just saying what he knows and what he's learned. And the and the uh, then the student realizes, oh, this master, your, your your cup's overflowing. Stop, stop pouring out. He says, no, no, you stop. 
your cup is full. What could I possibly teach you? That's blessed in the blessed in the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Um, blessed are the poor in spirit. The it, the the question was, right, Scott? Can you repeat it for me? Yeah, sure. Just just takeaways in general from Michael Singer and his book and his book, The Untethered Soul. Who several people actually, let me put it this way: the people I know who have read that book. With, without question, count it as one of the most influential books they've read, myself included. Um, I've never talked to somebody and said, hey, have you read The Untethered Soul? And they're like, yeah, it's kind of all right. I, I don't remember much about it. Somebody or everybody who's read it has some epic takeaway from it. And so I'm just wondering kind of your takeaway. And, and since you have so much reverence for the man, you've met him, you've studied under him, you know, you probably have greater insight than I do. I've read one book of his um, okay. and, and it was good enough and deep enough where I'm like, I don't know if I'm ready for part two. Um, so, so maybe your takeaways from, from knowing him, training under him, another book of his that I haven't read, just what, what's the, what's the, what's the big aha moment for Rob from Michael Singer? So I would say an aha moment comes if you're reading the book in the beginning and he's sitting down on the sofa and he's talking with his friend and he says, Hey, do you have that voice in your head? And there's a pause and his friend says, yeah. And they're like, what's that all about? Both of those go on a journey. The untethered soul doesn't doesn't I think link back to the friend, but the the surrender experiment says what happened to the friend. Very high powered attorney, I think he became. But again, the voice in the head. So, what it was for for so that's a big that's a big one, and you can take that rabbit trail down pretty far. You start getting into meditation, you start getting into prayer, you start you start getting into that's what mindfulness is about. Where you're, how many of your six to 70,000 thoughts a day are you conscious of? Hmm. Not enough. Right? So, how present are you showing up in life? What I would share for the techniques are there's a word that's called a samskara. And a samskara, some religions, have what's called an original sin. I believe that that's what a samskara, it's a different word for it, but they are ener stored energy patterns. So, so we would pretty much everybody would agree that this is the only moment that ever exists, right? Right now. Most of the time we're angry about the past or anxious about the future. It can be when we're not feeling great. Right. And if you ask somebody, how you doing? <laughs> If I did my Philadelphia accent, right? Uh, oh, good, good. Yeah, really? Yeah, yeah, How you yeah, doing? Good. Like, like usually there's this suffering, there's this desire. That's what the Buddha talks about and all these things. So where, where Singer comes in is he helps you understand, look, first of all, it's not your fault. You're a human being. It, it, unfortunately, this is just seems like how, how we are right now. But there's these energy patterns that are stored in your body. And the, 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 the goal is to be letting them out because they want to get out. So when I first got high in high school, I was, it was a form of suppression from what I wasn't comfortable with, which was a lot of stuff. I don't like that my mom's sick with cancer and I, is she going to die? Like, I don't like that I have all these pressures on their grades and am I even going to go to school? I like cutting lawns. Like, I don't like that that girl isn't calling me back anymore. Like, so there's these, some people are better with that was an event, it happened and moving on. And other people, that was an event, I'm going to put all this meaning behind the event and I'm going to suppress the event. So it's kind of like if we were outside and the skunk sprayed somewhere and it smelled really bad, we would get away from the skunk. But psychologically and emotionally, we as humans, we bottle up the spray. We bottle up what we don't want to have. We give our consciousness to it, our awareness to it, and we bring it home with us. And that's what is in the root of a lot of trauma. Uh, and that's what can keep us sick. And then when it tries to come out, it's kind of like eating bad food, but we don't stop eating the bad food. We just, we just have more Pepto-Bismol. And the Pepto-Bismol is more work, more money, more girlfriends, more boyfriends, uh, more downloads, 
uh, more. It's more, more, more. Right. It's it's more vacations. We went to Hawaii, but yeah, it was eh, the weather waves are eh. Costa Rica is where the real surfing is, man. You got to get down to Costa Rica. That's the Pepto Bismol for life. We unfortunately think that the problem is we ran out of Pepto Bismol or it stopped working. And what we, what we got to realize is we were eating bad pizza. <laughs> we we're eating bad food. And that's what Singer gets to very simply but it's deep. He gets there. And he says, here's what you do about this. When you're feeling that feeling, when it's coming up, when I go upstairs and, 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 and the kids are being a little unruly or I'll be stressed just seeing my wife stressed. And I feel this energy. There's a technique that he teaches called relax and release where you literally pull your shoulders back, you drop them down and you just breathe. And what you're actually doing is, is if you do not, it's the, it's called the transmutation of energy. That That's as succinct as I can put it. That's what Michael Singer and these yogis are teaching is how to transmute the energy versus suppressing it down, which is not healthy, but it's not going to end you up. You're not going to go to jail for suppressing your energy. You will go to jail from the other way, which is expressing your energy. This is talking about transmuting the energy. And we become like this vase that when we pour the energy, the Shakti, the Chi, the spirit, depends on what religion you are, what you're going to call it, we begin to transmute this energy through our body. And you've seen these people. You've seen where their eyes are really, really bright and really vibrant. They show up very present. They, they, they walk into a room and you're like, wow, like, like it, it, the energy changes on those person. They may not even know it. They don't need to know what a samskar is. They're just, they have their own ways, their own positive habits to to deal with. That's what, that's really what this is. Then he goes on to say, have a, have a morning ritual and an evening ritual for your spirituality because spirituality is 24 seven. And it's as simple as recognizing that you're not the thing that, that thinking part of the mind, the thoughts that you didn't think, because there's nothing wrong with the mind. I gave a talk before and I, I put the mind on blast that no, if I could go back in time and I'm sure hopefully my consciousness will rise and I'll become more aware. And maybe I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go back 10 years on this one and be like, man, how do you, why, why do you explain it like that? Maybe that's just the voice in the head too. Um, uh, but it's about the transmutation of energy, Scott. And, it, and it's about, I, I believe it's called Satchitananda, like never new, never ending joy. Not like one-time stuff that fades, getting the Rolex, getting the business deal. Um, getting the pat on the back and like he's talking about like and and he exudes this but in like a very um peaceful way he doesn't need the outside the man doesn't really leave florida he has this these yogis that you see like they have this and i'm not uh i'm not talking about going off to the himalayas and all this stuff like i have a i have a kind of a tribe and we work on this type of work and we do this together. I do it with my business partner. And like, we want to, we want to, we want to show up the best versions of ourselves each day and know that that's going to be different based upon how much energy we have and what's, you know, what's going on that day. Uh, but that's how important uh, uh, Mickey's work is uh, to me. And um, um, yeah, I appreciate you letting me share, you know, no, it, it, it's great. And, you know, it's funny because I always think of like the audience that we probably have on this podcast, although small and growing, um, probably a lot of realtors, loan officers, kind of top producers. And I, I can feel either the eye rolls or the, um, yeah, that's great because he's already made it. But I'm in grind phase where I'm having to, you know, grow and produce and whatnot. And I think one of the myths of all this stuff, the untethered soul having your, your yogi or, or a spiritual leader or whatnot. I, I think there's a danger because I, I feel it and I'm trying not to be judgmental and intentionally trying to embrace it and not be judgmental. And there's still this little bit of like, yeah, but really what you're talking about is maybe like apathy and like how, how can you go crush it as a man, a father, a business owner, if you're just happy and you're just accepting of things and you don't listen to the little voice that's trying to, to drive you. So can you speak a little bit to that of like, 
no, this doesn't mean you give up and you just acquiesce and you're a pushover and you're, you know, you're just, um, you know, you're, mm -hmm. you're apathetic about everything. It's just a yeah. different operating system. Because I, I think that's the danger. When people hear this kind of stuff, they're like, oh, that's a really cool foo-foo state to get to yeah. once sure. you're rich or once you have the great house or what. But, you know, you couldn't have yep. got there if you didn't that's have right. that drive and that voice in the yep. head telling you that mm -hmm. you're a piece of shit. Go close another deal. Yeah, you're right. You could have gotten there much faster. <laughs> you could have gotten there much faster. Great question, dude. Like this is your like it's when I was listening to your episode, I'm like, I'm excited to jump on here. Um apathy's down here. And there's a scale for this. You can you can actually Google ag flap. Anger, grief, apathy, fear, lust, pride. Then it gets to higher states, like relationships and and like courageousness. And then it gets to like this level of like level of like love, like pure apathy and peace are opposite ends of the spectrum. You show up to a negotiation in peace. There's not much that anybody can say to you, do to you, this thing, that thing. You're at peace with it. That's what the releasing technique talks about. Can you be okay with not getting that deal? And can you be okay with getting the deal? And it, it's amazing if you trust the process and it does take some faith because this is not the normal book that we're reading, right? It's becoming more so where... You can say less, but me, but be more powerful in your words and be more present as to what's really going on. Um, so I get the, you will not hear me say words like grind because I did grind. You know what I ground? I ground down my adrenal glands, left hip, left ankle, back. I ground, I ground, I grinded. <laughs> uh, visceral fat above 10 but like i looked okay but it was like a lot of that yeah so uh, i'm not much into the grinding what we are after is energy it's i don't know what time it is but i've been up for 17 hours right like didn't need anything i'm here fully present um you the so I don't know if I answered it or if I was convincing enough, but I have to be at peace with that because somebody has got to want to try it and say, you know what, can I do this? If you go to an Anthony Robbins on, on you know, uh, unleash the power within, can I do this for another five years? Like what's going to be left? Right. Um, when I get there, Singer talks about, he gave a private talk. I, I went down there with like 15 people and he, he, he like picture a tree that grows and then the trunk splits and it like grows like this like away from each other. Cause he says, look, you're all, he knew we were business people, some abundance people, some M one people, some other, uh, every man's mastermind, these friends. And he says, you think you're going to get here in business, but you're going to feel this way in healthy. And the, the answer is we, we don't because you, you have already reached goals that you wanted to have a few years ago. You're still the same soul. You're still the same observer. You're still then, and now you're just leveling up on them. So what is, but you say, yeah, but those, it's true. Make peace with wherever you're at in life is a big tip there. You make peace with where you're at and, and just know that, yes, up until this point, it served you. The grinding, the, the, the more it served you, but just awake just sit there, just have a few minutes of silence and just maybe do a heart prayer. Be okay with yourself. Like Anthony Robbins, who's another, who's another you know, mentor type figure. He says, there's two biggest fears in the world. Number one is you're not good enough. And number two is a fear of death. Like all this legacy and all this strategic planning that I do now, because you, know, you make money. Now you got to keep the money. Now you got to do tax planning. Now you want to pass it on. The old it doesn't stop. Right. Like right. money is not my bitch anymore. But I but I almost went down that same path of like obsessing over 
planning and this and now this beach house and that, but I got the beach house, I got the boat, da, 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 da. And, and that to me is like the fear of the death or it's like the fear of just not being good enough. So for the listeners out there that are saying, I don't want to get soft. I don't want to get slow. I don't going to guess what I, I did because the grinding wasn't working for me anymore. Like I did put a hurting on my adrenal glands or I would work this, uh, this life happiness index. And I'd be up here in the finances, but now my relationship over there with my wife is good, but my kids isn't good. Or my, it's not good with my in-laws or it's not good here. Or man, the body's taking it like I'm getting a little belly again or, Oh, geez. And like, man, if you can just get present, if you can just make peace with yourself and you just show up to whatever that next thing is, believe me, the emails aren't going to stop. The, the opportunities aren't going to stop coming. That's not the world we live in. Right. Um, but you can show up and you can, you can you know, sit on that park bench and just like enjoy the sandwich that you're eating or whatever it is. Enjoy the ski trip. But see, I would be at the beach, but I wouldn't be at the beach. The thoughts would be somewhere else. So then I was never present with life. So my tree grew separate. And Singer says, come back, Re- come back and and just enjoy this journey. And you do, you do not need to have everything figured out. The universe, your brain is about three pounds, two and a half, three pounds. It is no match for the power of this universe. <laughs> it's so true, man. It's, so it's not going to figure it out. It's just stop figuring it out. The more you know, the more you will know you don't know. Totally. Yeah. I, I got I got a couple follow up questions just because if you got if you've got a few more minutes um, at all time we need perfect. H- how much has this helped? Because I, I know you mentioned just in passing that you know you have a you have a child on the spectrum and then you have a I believe a daughter that has Down syndrome. Um, how has this helped you been more present um, with the challenges of raising children and specifically special needs children? Because you know there's days where I'm pulling my hair out and and my kids are pretty well behaved they don't have any physical or mental disabilities that i know of um and and it's tough man i only have two of them and you got double the number and double the challenges so you know where whatever you want to share on that story as as a father or or making those decisions with your daughter or like how has this helped you with that yeah so i wasn't using when i got the diagnosis of my of our daughter uh, at the eight week blood work, my wife gets a phone call. I'm working from home. Uh, it's a phone call from the hospital, from the doctor's office. She texts me, Hey, can you come outside? And I'm like, this is weird. Why is she texting me? I'm right in the garage at the home office. And that's when um, they were basically, Hey, just, you know, schedule your abortion. Uh, you know, your daughter uh, didn't say daughter, yeah, child, trisomy 21 is a technical term. And my, and my wife said, whoa, whoa, whoa. well, can you at least tell me if it's a girl or if it's a boy? And it was baby girl. Then we we didn't make a decision right on the spot. We we called our parents. We 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 explained them what happened. They said, "Well, whatever you decide, we support you." Which is like, okay, what does that even mean? Right. Um, and then we we sat in the car, and it was a peaceful place. And I pu- I pulled up. I googled like Im- girl with Down syndrome. It's like this little baby. And like I said, Emma, that's my wife's name. I said, "What are you afraid of with this with this birth? What are you afraid of?" And she listed her fears, and she says. One of the first things she said was, I'm afraid you're going to leave me. Yeah. I'm like, whoa. And then she says, like, I'm afraid we're going to, like, do we even have enough money? Like, what's this going to mean? Right? My daughter's almost, um, uh, she'll be six real soon. Then I, my fears were money, time, like, how are we going to do all this? And I said, and that's where we just said, we can do this. We had faith, believing in that next step. And we named her Faith. It's going to be Ashley. So your question was, Scott, how does all of this, because see, my measure of success right now, and and, and it was even when I wasn't um, as financially secure as I am now, and there, there's more ways to go on that, and being more physically fit, and all these more and more wars, and all these gardens of life, it was how am I showing up as a father when I get home? Because I was still like working on hours and I like talking go- to a real estate club more than I like going home and processing the kids to bed yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and like helping with homework or, or, you know, I would be a lot, I would be frustrated a lot. So 
certainly not perfect with it. For me, I, I require a certain amount of, of uh, just wellness care, um, massage, uh, uh, chiropractic, like different things that I do, exercise. Uh, it, it, it is, I had to let go. I had to apply. For me, I can apply the 12 steps to all areas of my life. I am not in control that my daughter is Down syndrome and that my son is Asperger's or that really now my 13-year-old daughter is having trouble making friends at school. We switch schools and she's really frustrated and she's she's thinks she's this body morph, this thing, that thing. Like I'm not in control of this stuff. I really didn't cause this stuff. How can I, but how can I help? How can I show up? That's not a level of apathy, anger, fear, greed. Those are higher consciousness states to actually be able to show up to help. And I'll give this example that Singer gives. If I had a fear of blood and my son, daughter, your son, daughter, or you yourself comes running up, up, up to me and is bleeding and I can't handle the sight of blood, I can't help you. Because see, down at the temple, a lot of activists go down there. A lot of people that are very fired up about a certain way life should be, right? Because that's what it is. The two and a half pound brain is trying to say how an ever expanding universe that's been, that's been expanding for like 14, 15, 18 billion years since the Big Bang to create us, these human meat suits, is the, the three pound brain wants to say that it shouldn't be this way. So you can't, if you can't deal with the blood, if you can't deal with the baby crying, if you can't deal with the 13 year old, that's like trying to find her identity or, 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 or the son that's had the rough thing because his paper airplane stops working. Whatever. If I cannot transmute that energy and become myself, there's, there's a, there's a, it's something called the Sri Atma Gita. They sing it every morning at the temple. And one of the lines is like, calm in the midst of the mightiest storms. Can you be that way? If you're that loan officer and that deal is going sideways, man, that there's a part of your mind that loves the chaos, that loves that. Let me come in and save this and you suck and this thing. And I told you that. Yeah. Can you just be calm? Can you just listen to the parties? Do you not have to do all this? Could you just maybe move one or just send one email or maybe not send the email? And what it does is it brings you all this work. I don't meditate for the sentiment for the sake of meditation. I don't work a 12 step to work a 12 step. I work it to show up in life. And by showing up in life, fully present to whatever's going to come, I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. I was getting off a plane from Temple of the Universe when like the world started shutting down like a week later. But I was getting tinglings of like, man, Emma, maybe we should go to Costco and just stock up. And I'm the guy that like wants to be more frugal and I don't like like these full pantries and we might waste some blueberries, you know? Right, right, right. It's like they were in the back of the fridge, right? I'm like, oh my God, just in time inventory. Side. So I could get on a, on a tangent there. The piece is, is, is very powerful. We're talking about very high energy. Um, we're talking about growing your tree in one trunk and not thinking that when you get there, that you're going to feel a different way. Because if it, what happened to you happened to me where you get there and you don't feel that way, now what the fuck are you going to do? Yeah, now you got to fill that gap with some type of addiction, presumably. Or a lot of people do. Um, or you just give up. Or you start playing small. Yeah. Some people have like they literally will self-sabotage themselves because they were there or I was there, but then it didn't work. I had to work through all that stuff. I don't want to I don't want to talk to a real estate club. I'm a failure. I'm a this. I'm a that. I, I thought I would be this way or the, these units and this. Dude, we rebuilt the whole company. Yeah. So don't give up. Have faith. It's not all about you. You talk, you start talking to talking some higher level states. And there are books out there that are helpful, like The Go-Giver, right? That's one. Um, there are books that talk about this level of abundance. I bet you if I reread 
Think and Grow Rich, I would have a different filter. See, I don't blame any of that. I don't blame the schools or this. It was just my filter. It was me, 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 me. Right. You know, it's interesting you made the go-giver because I feel like this is an endless internal debate with me of, you know, give until it hurts, be the intellectual philanthropist, be at peace, and motherfucker, I really wanted to get that loan to closing, but because I sent one email and this dickhead down the down the hall sent 37 emails and was a jerk about it, my peacefulness with the situation got interpreted by other people as like, well, he can wait. Squeaky wheel gets the gets the oil and he got to close his loan and I didn't. And he got to look like the hero and I'm the one that got screamed at by the realtors. And he's the one that, you know, got the commission this month, which teared him up, which did this, but did this. And, you know, my loan bled over till next month, which in the grand scheme of things, somebody's going to live in this house for 12 years, getting it three days late is not a big deal, except for the fact that it is. And so I'm, I'm constantly balancing this, like, be at peace, go-giver mentality, you know, uh, nice guys do actually finish first at the end of it. And you know what? Fuck it. I keep seeing these assholes getting ahead. And it's, it's, it's an ongoing internal dialogue that I'm having with myself. And, I, and I'd love to say that I'm the more evolved man and I've found my version of Michael Singer Guru who's like talked to me through this, but I haven't. I'm still, I'm still conflicted on a daily basis about exactly that thing, sending the 37 emails versus the one email. I, yeah, maybe we can dive into that on, uh, at another time because yeah. I would want to know a little bit more about what you're, what you're saying, but I can relate to when you're feeling this frustration and you're feeling that um, I, I, I mean, at, at a, I could probably be wealthier on some ways if I wanted to grow that garden more. But I, what I found is to grow in like a harmony and not f- trying to get to one certain milestone in one garden. And look, I it's is it going to be harder? If if the bills aren't getting paid, if if your children aren't getting fed, if they if they if they don't have like that's not the average person that's probably listening to your podcast. That's not the average person that even I've seen. There's a lot of social services that help a lot of people. We are absolutely one of the most abundant countries in this land. You you know I haven't been to these uh, these other countries, but I have been to some of them. Um, you know I'm I'm really grateful to be here. It's not a perfect yeah. country. Uh, none are. Um, but it's but pretty fucking amazing. And also it's pretty, like it, it, one it's pretty of, amazing. one, if not the safest, most abundant times in human history to live. And all of us, myself included, sometimes on this podcast can only focus on the negative. And, and uh, what I would say is I may not be able to solve that thing with this theme about that, but if you can get a technique, just get back to your breath and take the extra 30 seconds. You will let go of some of these psalm scars. They will naturally start to come up. Now, if they were stored with pain, some of them, if they were stored with pain, they will come up with pain. Meditation, most people say, I can't meditate. Tried it, couldn't do it. Well, look, the first time you meditate, you're not going to see white lights and it's not going to be quiet. (laughs) Wait, I don't do like five sit-ups and then I have six-pack abs? I have to do it daily? No, it's take seven. (laughs) What you are hearing when you're meditating, the purpose of meditation is not to control the mind. It's to not let the mind control you. You are actually, if it's noisy up there, that's a good thing. That's There's no good or bad meditation. I like transcendental. I repeat a mantra over and over. I get about 30 seconds in and I forget the mantra. I stop saying the mantra because the mind is percolating these things up. We have, a, we have a system to get rid of our food waste, right? We clean our clothes. We wash our cars, but nothing's washing the psyche. That's not part of our culture. And that's, I don't want to uh, be out of line here, but when you shared about what happened with your friends, those were positive habits that they had. The gym, a lot of depressed people at the gym. Yeah. And they need that. Because the body is creating uh, endorphins or whatever it is to help with this other energy to counteract it. And when they don't have that outlet, boom, it explodes. That energy, boom. 
Um, but meditation is powerful, but don't give up. Over time, and you just come back to a mantra, it uh, actually allows your mind to process this stuff that's down there. And that releases these some scars and they can come up naturally as different events happen. So then that way you're not losing it. You can be calm on the voice, like calm in the midst of the mighty storm. That's the most powerful as we can be. And you show up to it. Yeah. Well, you don't need to just shut off the cell phone and like, I'll take three drinks tonight and I'll get it down tomorrow. Like maybe what you need to do. Hey, if that's what you need to do to get through the night, get through the night. Um, but that's not going to be a habit that's going to get you to where you might be able to be. Yeah, definitely not going to serve you. Yeah. All right, I'll give you two softball questions to end this up because I, I feel like we could talk all night long. Um, it's a good way to get to know somebody. Fa- favorite movie and why? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a movie nutcase. So, you? oh, man. Talking about meditation, going to see a movie, and especially okay. if I can watch a movie – uninterrupted with a cigar, like on an iPad or go to a theater where it's socially unacceptable for anybody to have their phone out. Okay. That's like my meditation, my suspension yes. of disbelief, no cell yes. phone, no distractions. It's like, yes. I, I saw sing Two this weekend. It, it, this podcast will probably come out in February or March. Cause we're way yeah. ahead of schedule. Thank God. Um, but we're recording this in December of 2021. I just saw sing Two with my kids and man, just being present with the kids, watching yes. a movie, laughing together, cell phone off, to me, to me, that's yes. meditation. To me, that's the clearest yes. point of mind. And um, well, you like it so much. You're yeah. present. And so you can have that all the time. Yeah, I, I, I want that all the time. So we're going to have a further conversation about that. So for you, uh, favorite, favorite movie and why? Last time I said, last time I answered this question was on a GoBondance trip on the, on the uh, Inca Trail. And uh, they didn't, the one guy didn't like my answer. Well, I, I have no judgment. One of my favorite movies is Lucy. Lucy with uh with Scarlett Johansson. Yep. Is that is that and the one where she takes I the drugs it. and she gets super smart? Yeah. I just think and and she there's this one scene where I think she's in a car and uh like we have our phones, right? And like they're getting all this data and she could see it. It gets into like string theory and stuff where this whole universe is made of like a series of like zeros and ones and like they've freaking seen this stuff, like that we are the matrix and yada yada yada. It's it's one of my favorite movies. Like I I, I the And most importantly, Scarlett Johansson, not so rough on the eyes. Not so rough at all. <laughs> All right. And then uh, due to the fact that we're filming this kind of hopefully as we round the corner on the craziness of the last two years, politically, socially, mandates, this and that. But what are you looking forward to getting back to? Or what's something that's been missing in your life over the last 18 months that you're like, man, I really can't wait to get back to this? My life is is uh, pretty similar to what it was. I, I, I pre- kind of go about my day. Um, I'm, in, I'm in more of the suburbs of Philadelphia, so there's not as much constraints as to where I go and what I do. I'd like to get back down to the temple of the universe. It's been, uh, it's been closed. And they won't let you in. Um, um, that's something that I that I look forward uh, that I look forward to doing. And I would look forward to, but I don't know if it's going to happen. Just less hate, less people. Uh, we literally went from like black, like fighting the one percent to then to then race to now masks and vaccines and um, my fear would be that if this goes away, what the hell's next? And uh, that's a sad, maybe it's a maybe too realistic place to be. Yeah. Um, but I would look forward to going down to Florida. I would look forward to, 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 to just um, getting to walk those grounds I've told my I've told my my children about it. God forbid if anything happens to me, I want them to head down there and just learn from some of this stuff and and do all this stuff. It's the most that I could do as a man and a father. Um, and I'd be looking to forward to some more to go on its trips and just more of the more of the um, interactions and less people afraid, uh, uh, more people enjoying life. This is a gift that we've been given to be here in this universe. We're, we're the, one of the highest of beings that I'm aware of, and um, 
I don't want any of us uh, uh, to waste a minute. And I certainly don't want to hear um, uh, that lives could have been spared yeah. you know, on any side of it. So that's what I'd like to manifest. Well, that's the way to end the podcast, Rob. And uh, when you do take one of these journeys, hit me up because I'm, I'm interested in tagging along. And uh, I'm also interested in having you back on the podcast, basically, so I can just get some free coaching on this stuff that you seem to be uh, a few steps ahead on the path than, than I am. So, man, really from the bottom of my heart, thanks so, thanks so much for being on and sharing so openly because uh, that's what makes a conversation great. Even if nobody ever hears this, I, uh, I appreciate it, man. 